Always We ask the U četiri mjeseca ove godine na Mediteranu je život izgubilo više od 1500 osoba. Iz zaračenih i siromašnih zemalja Bliskog istoka i Sjeverne Afrike u Europu je stiglo približno 35.000 migranata. Pravo na život, na slobodno kretanje, pravo na dostojanstvo, na slobodu govora. Povjerenik Vijeća Europe za ljudska prava upozorava kako se ta prava sustavno krše diljem svijeta. Kritike ne štedi ni na račun Europske unije, niti zemalja naše regije. Na odgovornost i djelovanje poziva političke lidere. So, Mr. Commissioner, uh, thank you very much for joining us. In your latest report, you say that 2014 was a bad year when we talk human rights. Um, if we look only at the tragedies at the Mediterranean, 2015 hasn't started much better, hasn't it? No, it's been an awful beginning to the year. And I hope that these tragedies will actually finally uh, force a change in, in the policy of many European countries and the European Union as a whole. Whose fault actually is it? We are counting numbers, more than 1,500 deaths only this year. Mm -hmm. Whose fault is it? I think it's a collective failure on the part of, of Europe uh, because the Mediterranean is clearly a European sea. And until now, almost all the countries who are not on the, directly on the Mediterranean Sea have wanted to let those countries deal with uh, these tragedies, deal with saving people, and deal with processing their, their asylum claims. And there clearly needs to be a European approach. We need European search and rescue. Uh, we need a European uh, sharing of the responsibility for uh, migrants and asylum seekers. And we need uh, a, a much more serious engagement with the countries of origin as well. Um, and thus far, uh, it has just not happened. Italy has, has done a lot in terms of saving people, uh, but everybody else has kind of watched uh, with horror and uh, there have been a lot of words and, and very little action. You have said uh, in one of your uh, response to the most recent tragedy uh, that the uh, European Union needs change in the uh, migration and asylum policies, whereas uh, the UN human rights chief also said that um, actually uh, it's the symptom, not the cause, because the European Union is not uh, legally letting migrants in. Uh, would you mm -hmm. agree with his point of view? And when you say change of policy, what actually do you mean with it? Well, I think, first of all, uh, the Syrian refugee crisis is one of the largest uh, humanitarian crises in the world today and the biggest to, to happen on the doorsteps of, of Europe for uh, in the last 20 years. Uh, and the response of Europe has been completely inadequate. We know that these people need protection, uh, but very few countries have welcomed them with, with open arms in Europe. Turkey has done a fantastic job, 1.6 million people. Uh, all the other Council of Europe member states have done very little uh, in comparison. Germany has about 120,000 uh, asylum seekers, uh, refugees from, from Syria. Uh, Sweden has done a good job, but almost all the other countries uh, have done very, very little. And it's clear if the people are desperate, uh, they will try to make the journey to Europe. But it's not just Syria, it's many countries uh, in, in Africa and Asia and elsewhere. Um, and uh, they have no or very few legal venues for reaching Europe. Uh, no humanitarian visas, a few resettlement programs, uh, uh, family reunification is quite difficult in, in, in many cases. Uh, so it is a symptom, uh, the fact that these people are dying, trying to reach Europe when there should be other means uh, that they can reach Europe if they really need protection. Can I ask you very bluntly, because people, uh, some people are asking themselves that, um, why is it actually our problem? Why is it European problem? Why does the EU uh, need to do all this? Well, if you look globally, the EU is not the largest destination for uh, refugees and asylum seekers. There are countries like South Africa and Pakistan and others which are much poorer. Or if you look in terms of the Syrian refugee crisis, uh, you look at places like Lebanon and Jordan, uh, which have received uh, hundreds of thousands of people. The numbers coming to Europe are not that big. And Europe has among the wealthiest the societies in the world, and every country in Europe has signed up uh, to, to the Refugee Convention. We have obligations that we need to, to fill, uh, and it's clear that uh, we are not fulfilling those obligations at, the t at this moment. On the other side, has the Europe failed in compassion? Yes, it has failed in compassion because it sees the approach has been primarily security oriented. What can we do to stop the arrival of people? What can we do to better, uh, to have more surveillance, more uh, more fences, more, uh, to, to stop the people from coming and not why are these people coming? 
which of them need protection and how can we improve our approach and how can we make it more human rights oriented? Uh, just recently, ministers for foreign affairs reached a sort of a political agreement on a 10 points plan. Uh, among others, there's an idea to uh, capture and destroy vessels of smugglers uh, going into another civil military operation. Is that a solution or will it just cause more deaths? I think that that's part of the solution is to stop, uh, to attack the, the, to get the traffickers and, and smugglers. But uh, this is a symptom. People who want to, to reach Europe will, and, and have a, will, they will pay uh, smugglers to get here. Uh, during the Mare Nostrum operation, not only were uh, 150,000 or more people saved, uh, but a number of smugglers' boats were, were captured and, and smugglers themselves were, were, uh, were, were tried. Uh, so I think that's part of the solution. But until now, that's been the primary approach of many European countries, and I think that's inadequate. There seems to be more questions still in the air uh, about the ideas of the EU, how to solve the situation, uh, but only this uh, capturing and destroying vessels, civil military operation, sounds lots of like um, kind of a war. I mean, after all, smugglers mm. are a criminal organization. I assume they will defend their business, no? Yes, I, they will defend their business, and the, and the desperate people will find other ways to, to reach here, uh, to reach here by land or, or, or by sea. Um, so that is, that is not really the solution. That is also a symptom, uh, and we cannot, we cannot avoid uh, looking at the root causes of, of the desperation of people who are willing to risk death, uh, torture, everything to, to reach Europe. Uh, one of the points also mentions uh, establishing a program of return. Uh, what does actually this return mean? Mm. Uh, doesn't that mean just the same killing them? I mean, they are fleeing mm. from war, mm. from desperation, from poverty. So where are they? I mean, where would we send them back to? Well, not everybody can be sent back. It's clear you cannot send people back to Syria. You cannot send people back to, to many countries in, in Africa. Uh, but what we need to do is look at each case on an individual basis to assess whether or not that person has a valid claim uh, for protection. And if they don't, uh, then they can be returned uh, to their country of origin. If their country is not in the midst of a war, if they, will not, if they do not face uh, persecution when they return. And there are many people like this. Not everybody has a valid claim. Uh, and returns can be voluntary or they can be involuntary. Um, until now, uh, most, of the, most returns are involuntary. People are forced to go back, uh, <coughs> and there have been often abuses uh, uh, during this process. Uh, what we need also is to help when people do not have a valid protection claim, uh, but they're fleeing poverty, to provide them incentives to return to their country, to help them set up a business in their own country. And there has been some work on this area, uh, but returns are, have to be part of any uh, rational asylum policy. You cannot let everybody come, uh, even those who do not have an asylum claim. Uh, this, then, then the whole system breaks down. So do you think that this 10 points plan will be enough? Is it at least a start? It's a small start. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very cautious because until now, uh, similar plans have not really brought results. And many of the measures are still voluntary, voluntary distribution, voluntary resettlement. And we know that there are very few volunteers uh, in Europe uh, to help uh, refugees. Um, but I, I think that it's a, it's a first small step forward, and I'm, and I'm hoping to see much more. Because it's not just about solidarity towards uh, migrants, towards uh, refugees, right? I mean, it's solidarity among member states as mm -hmm. well. And there we see kind of uh, splitting uh, between member states, yeah. south, east, everyone uh, taking care of their own problems. Exactly. It's a complete lack of solidarity within Europe. Uh, <coughs> and what's interesting is that you see countries that thought they would never be faced uh, with uh, mig migration flows suddenly being faced and realizing how important uh, European solidarity is. Um, so the, the, the key thing is, uh, will, will countries begin to think in the long term that they cannot afford to, to stand aside, that they might need assistance in the future as well? So we have uh, one crisis, some even call it like on Mediterra Mediterranean, uh, making a vast cemetery out of it mm. on the east. We have Russia, Ukraine crisis. Uh, where is the Europe heading actually with this division of problems, so mm. to speak? Well, these are, these are the two you mentioned, the most serious problems that I have, uh, I have been dealing with, migration and, and the Ukrainian uh, crisis. Uh, but there are many, many other uh, human rights crises in Europe as well. Um, <coughs> for example, very bad counterterrorism policies that are often being discussed and, and adopted uh, in many European countries now. Uh, the situation of Roma remains desperate. The situation of human rights defenders in many countries, in particular Azerbaijan, remains very dire. 
Um, so there are many, many different human rights crises. It's a, it's a very bad environment right now for human rights. Uh, thus, European cooperation, legal norms, uh, the work of the Council of Europe, I think, is more needed than ever. But the, 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 the environment is not very friendly. You said very bad counterterrorism uh, measures. So what would you expect in that field to be done? Well, what I have urged countries to do is go slowly, consult with your human rights experts, with your human rights ombudsman, with your, uh, uh, with your civil society, uh, because haste is not a good counselor in this situation. Um, second of all, to make sure that, lo that laws are very precise, uh, that they cannot be applied arbitrarily. Uh, third, we have to not learned the lessons of the Snowden affair and the dangers of, of mass surveillance. That is both uh, violates human rights and it's ineffective in terms of, of combating terrorism. Uh, and of course, not to stigmatize Muslims uh, as, as being all, all terrorists. This was a huge mistake, I think, that we made over the last 15 years in, in many different countries. Um, and it actually undermines the cause of counterterrorism. It breeds alienation, which then can feed into radicalization. Recently, we have witnessed attacks in Paris. Uh, there, was, there were some uh, anti-terrorist actions uh, in Belgium as well. Uh, will we be seeing more of that? Well, I, I think in democracies, 100% security is, is not uh, a reachable goal. And, and uh, you would have to sacrifice all of your freedoms to, to reach it. And I don't think any European society is ready to do that. But terrorism is not a new threat in Europe. We have seen terrorism uh, in many different countries in Europe uh, for, uh, for tens of years already. Uh, I think there are some new aspects to it. Uh, the uh, returning, returning jihadis from foreign conflicts, this is a relatively new phenomenon. Uh, but also the technological means available to governments, uh, and not just governments, uh, to conduct surveillance and, and, and so on. Um, so there are some new elements to it, but the basic challenge uh, remains the same uh, as it's always been, to uphold human rights while countering terrorism. Uh, one of the ideas is, uh, or projects actually uh, soon about to be finished is uh, the passenger data records. Um, will it violate uh, human rights uh, as data protection mm. or will it really help as much as they are announcing it mm. will? Uh, to be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit skeptical that it will have a huge uh, impact on, 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 on the struggle against terrorism. Um, I think it's important that uh, safeguards uh, remain in place for data protection, that we should not uh, allow all of our data to be collected and used and, and everybody be placed under suspicion. Uh, this is a danger with these kinds of mass uh, untargeted measures, is that every, everybody becomes a suspect. Uh, and this is, this is not a, a good place for democracy to be in. You seem uh, very spectacle towards uh, quite a lot of things that EU is trying to do. Uh, what is your best advice? Uh, what would you be doing if you would be in charge of the EU? Of the EU? Oh, <laughs> I, I would not presume. <coughs> no, the EU does a good job in some areas, uh, and I want to see it do better uh, in other areas. Uh, actually, within the EU, uh, the, Euro the European Union has very little competence in human rights areas. For example, there is no EU a key on on freedom of expression or uh, prohibition of torture. Uh, there are certain areas where the EU has power uh, to legislate and has power to enforce its laws. And what I have urged is the EU to do better where it has this competence. Uh, and where it doesn't have competence, then it can cooperate uh, with, with the Council of Europe uh, and, and our institutions. Um, and this cooperation takes place. It's, it's very good. It can be better. Um, <clears throat> and I think what's interesting is the European Parliament is playing a more and more prominent role uh, in putting human rights on the agenda uh, at a political level, even if they don't have legal tools to address them. Um, and I think this is an interesting uh, development. But we have many good partners in the EU, so I don't want to say that everything that the EU does is bad. I think they do a lot of very good work. Are these two problems we've been talking about, uh, so anti-terrorism, uh, migration, is this something that will be dealt with in a certain time frame and then put aside and forgotten? Or should we get used to it as a sort of a new reality and something that uh, we will be seeing in news headlines for quite some time? I think, we will be, I think these two issues will be with us uh, for a long time. Uh, both the migration and asylum issues. This is also not a new issue. <coughs> it is, uh, we've seen large influxes of, of migrants and asylum seekers uh, in earlier decades as well. Uh, but given the unrest in, and the conflicts and the poverty in, in elsewhere in Europe, uh, for example, I was not so long ago in Malia 
the Spanish exclave in Morocco. And when you learn that the difference in income between Malia and Morocco is a factor of 12, that people in Malia are 12 times uh, <coughs> uh, more wealthy than, than people living in Morocco, you realize that this, this pressure, this migratory pressure, is not going to go away uh, from, uh, from the bordering areas and all of Europe, and that all of Europe needs to have a, a much more human rights-oriented policy and, and a long-term strategy to deal with migration. You have traveled to uh, Balkan countries as well last year. How would you assess the human rights issue if we focus on Western Balkans? Mm. Well, there are a number of problems that are, that are uh, kind of long-term uh, legacy problems, dealing with uh, kind of the, the consequences of the war and the conflict in ex-Yugoslavia, uh, combating impunity of perpetrators. Uh, I think every, in every country work needs to be done there. I was just in Serbia um, and there's some progress has been made. Uh, while I was in Serbia, uh, a number of uh, uh, charges were filed against people for the Srebrenica mass massacres. And I think it's a, I was very pleased to see that and I think it's, it was about time. Um, a lot of missing persons are still unaccounted for and this leaves a lot of anguish uh, for the families uh, who don't know what happened to their loved ones. They cannot uh, close that chapter in their lives. Uh, Roma, especially displaced Roma from, from Kosovo and, and other areas. I've, I've visited some of the nastiest uh, Roma settlements where people live in absolute poverty. Uh, I, was one, I was in one in outside of Belgrade where the children uh, hadn't washed in a long time and, they, and they're not in school. And I tried to convince the authorities. I said, listen, this is a, a disaster in the making. If you don't get these kids in school, this problem will be with you forever. Uh, and it will keep reproducing itself. So you have to address the education <coughs> of, of children. So Roma, uh, Roma is a huge challenge for the whole region, but it's a, it's a challenge everywhere in, in Europe. Um, so, and media freedoms in, in some countries I went to, uh, journalists really feel under threat. Uh, they feel like they're being surveyed by, by the government. Uh, organized crime might threaten them. Uh, in Serbia, for example, there are four journalists under full-time uh, police protection, uh, which shows uh, that it's quite a, a dangerous business to be uh, to be a journalist in, in this area. But let's let's talk discrimination a little bit uh, more. Uh, I'd say it's more about changing mindset, changing uh, the environment, the society. It takes generations, doesn't it? Yes, but you can move forward quite quickly, actually, mm -hmm. uh, if there's political leadership. We've seen this in, in other contexts. Um, but also in, in the Western Balkans, for example, attitudes towards LGBT persons. Uh, <coughs> in uh, right now, uh, or in the coming days, you will have a, a big uh, Idaho, the International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia event in Montenegro. Who would have imagined 20 years ago uh, that Montenegro would want to host a big international event on combating homophobia and transphobia? Uh, so it shows that progress is, is possible. Uh, with regard to Roma, uh, I think the, the key problem is uh, education, the lack of education, but also segregation. Segregation, when people live in, in settlements far away from the majority community, uh, this is a breeding ground for prejudice. Uh, when you don't interact with people, when you don't cooperate with them, when you begin to see them as a group and not as individuals, uh, this is what breeds uh, prejudice and, and, and discrimination, and we have to fight against it. <coughs> but political leadership can make a whole lot of difference. If I may, a bit bluntly again, uh, making their lives better means making our lives better? Yes, I, I mean, I think that these, this is a huge, first of all, we are wealthy enough to include all of the vulnerable people in our societies, not just Roma, but personal di disabilities, <coughs> uh, migrant, unaccompanied migrant children. We are not uh, poor societies that are falling apart. These are among the wealthiest societies uh, on the planet. Uh, second of all, they, have, they can make a real contribution to our societies, to our labor markets, to our culture, to our uh, political life, if we give them the chance. Uh, but we have to give them the chance. The majority that has power uh, has to involve these minorities and it has to combat the, the prejudice and discrimination that is so prevalent uh, in many countries. And already I have made a bit of a mistake in my question, dividing on them and us. <laughs> well, this is, uh, this, is a, this is a habit of mind that is, that is hard to break. They are, we are them and they are us. Talking a bit more about the uh, Balkans, which country would you say does the worst if you dare to assess it in that way? Well, I don't, I don't 
compare countries in this way, uh, but I, I've, I, and I have not visited all the countries uh, of the region yet. I still have to go to Bosnia and Herzegovina, <coughs> and I have not yet been to Kosovo. Kosovo is not a member, uh, member of the Council of Europe, um, but my predecessor did some work there. So I have an incomplete uh, picture of the region. Uh, but I think in, in each country you can find uh, areas where there's progress and, and some serious, serious problems. Um, as I said, I think all of the countries of the region have, have a lot to do uh, with regard to the past and past crimes uh, and accountability. All the countries have a lot to do with regard to Roma. Uh, <coughs> two of the countries that I went to, I focused on media issues, uh, Serbia and Montenegro. There the, the threats against journalists have been most prominent. Um, but when I talk about, uh, there's one issue that I've, I raised in, in, a, in a research paper about the right to leave a country. Uh, I found that particularly in the former Yugoslav Republic of, of Macedonia, uh, and a little bit in Serbia, there were efforts by the authorities to uh, restrict the emigration of people, the, the, the departure of primarily Roma residents, uh, because they were afraid that they would ask for asylum in Western Europe, and then Europe would retaliate by putting uh, visa requirements on the entire population. So some of the <coughs> measures put in place in these two countries are also problematic with regard to, to Roma. And when can we expect you to uh, travel to Bosnia and Herzegovina? Oh, it's, it's on my agenda. I must visit all uh, 47 member states of the Council of Europe. Uh, and uh, I, do not, I cannot mention a date right now, but uh, <coughs> I, will be going, I will be going there uh, in the relatively near future. What do you expect to see there? Well, I, I was there uh, not too long ago, I think a year and a half ago, uh, for the Srebrenica uh, commemoration. Um, and, of course, Bosnia, Bosnia and Herzegovina has a, the, the very tragic uh, situation in which so many powers are in the cantons uh, that it's very difficult to have uh, to move forward on an, a number of policy issues. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that by the time I, I visit there will be some progress on, on these issues, uh, but I'm not holding my breath because the Dayton Agreement I think really uh, kind of emasculated the, the, the central government and, and, and made it very difficult for them to move forward on many issues. Politicians within the EU don't really like to talk about the Dayton uh, issue. Now you mentioned it. I have to ask you, what do you think about it? Well, I, I think it was it was good to it was a it was a tool to stop the war, but it was not uh, a good tool to build a sustainable country. <coughs> Is it time for it to be rewritten? Well, replaced? I think we I think we need to move beyond Dayton now. Um, we need to move beyond Dayton and. and and uh, because there's so many issues that, that need to be resolved. A and the population is fed up with this dysfunctional uh, system of, of, of the separation of powers. And they, they, want, they want action, they want, they, want, they want to move forward. Talking human rights, uh, let's talk more optimistically. Which country is the best to live in if you want your rights to be protected? <laughs> well, I, I think that, uh, again, I, I don't compare countries uh, <coughs> but it's, it's clear that, for example, for the wealthier West European countries, uh, the most difficult issues that they deal with are how to cope in a human rights compliant way with, with migration uh, and, and asylum seekers. Uh, this is a very common topic for me uh, in these countries, but also uh, the situation of persons with disabilities. Uh, it is also very difficult in, in many countries, uh, even, in, even in the so-called old democracies or, or, or old member states. Um, so every country has human rights challenges. I would, not, I would not say that there is no human rights paradise in the Council of Europe. <coughs> Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.